Where the land meets the sea, an ever-changing world exists, one of resilience, survival, and beauty. North of Wales, while some come to explore beautiful mountains of slate, the increasing population of sheep, where there are more of them than people, or old buildings with stunning backgrounds, others come to explore the wildlife hiding beneath the rocks. North Wales rock pools may seem small, but they are teeming with life, revealing the incredible adaptability of nature. Every tide brings a new challenge. Creatures here have evolved to withstand the crashing waves, shifting temperatures, and even the dry heat of low tide. Scientists often come navigate the rocky shores of North Wales to study the interactions between its diverse species. This rugged coastline is home to a rich variety of fascinating marine life. These rock pools act as micro-ecosystems supporting a surprising variety of species, but they are also vulnerable to change. The main species vulnerable to change are some of the most complex on our shores. The curled octopus, the apex predator of the Welsh shores. It comes from nearly a thousand meters below the surface, coming up to shores to lay eggs or feed. This sometimes allows these curly characters to get trapped beneath the rocks after filling their bellies with a banquet of creatures, from bivalves that the animal has drilled into, or the bigger brutes of the rocks, such as edible crabs and lobsters. They are a key species in maintaining other predators' populations and providing space for other species to move in by eliminating some of the overcrowded within the tidal pools, thus continuing the circle of balance in our seas and shores. The eggs we see on this rock are that of the dog whelk. This miniature menace is another yet unlikely predator of the pools which feeds upon mussels and clams by drilling through a gap in its shell opening, which allows it to consume significantly larger prey than itself. Interestingly, it also holds to rocks during tidal change where it feeds on native and invasive species of barnacle making the dog whelk a natural help in controlling an invasive population. When these snails succumb to the elements, they still provide an enormous benefit to other species. Hermit crabs, which have no natural shell, will repurpose the shells of dead dog whelks and use them to keep themselves safe. Due to all different sizes of hermit crabs, all shells will be a great help to these other little nippers on our shores. The hermit crabs themselves, while being very different from other crabs, still display the characteristics of courtship, known from most crabs by protecting females when swapping shell or during mating. Similarly to these other crabs in the Welsh seas, he will put her safety before his own to ensure they both achieve their goals of survival in such a vast ecosystem where safety is never a guarantee. Other shelled species, such as the flat periwinkle, have their own unique adaptations with shells, as they have a unique genetic ability known as polymorphism. This explains why this one is yellow, which means it mostly clings onto macro weed, which it eats whilst camouflaging as a little weed bladder. They breed in great rates, and smaller periwinkles are a key source of food for the blenny species like Shani, which are among the most aggressive creatures on the shores of Wales. Rock gunnel are the other end of the spectrum, being timid mostly. They are still always ravenous for their next meal and displaying bright colours during the mating season to potentially attract males whilst confusing a would-be predator. These native species are all interesting and complex, but this could be the start of the end for them, due to a subtle threat on our stunning shores. Competition with invasive species is becoming a greater problem along the Welsh coast, with flora and fauna posing a threat when introduced into our seas. The only cause is totally linked to human interaction. Here, we'll delve into just a fraction of the different examples of invasive species on the coast of Wales. The invasive species have interesting origins to how they hitchhike to our shores. One such example is the Astreus barnacle which found its way to the isles by holding onto the keels of ships in the southern seas near New Zealand and Australia. Since then it competed with, and in some instances, outcompeted the native acorn barnacle. The native uh, and invasive um, barnacle, the difference is that the native barnacle has six overlapping parts to its shell and it looks like it has like um, almost like a devil's smiley face. It's like that as the gap on the shell. However, the invasive species from the Southern Ocean has, it's just a straight line 
down the middle and it's only got four overlapping sections on its shelf. Certain native creatures will prey upon the invasive barnacle, thus managing this invasive species' population, but these little colonies of barnacle may already be out of a natural control. Sticking with the colonizers of the cobbled shore, harpoon weed. It appears to have followed the barnacles from the southern seas, turning up from Australia and New Zealand through parts of vaults they came attached to, of which they came back from the other end of the earth to invade our shores. They are one of the quickest invaders in Europe and are especially damaging to our native kelp ecosystems. Next, we have a very different introduced species, one of speculation and controversy of whether it is invasive or lives peacefully among native species. The softshell or gaper clam is one such species that has integrated and made its mark so well over hundreds of years that not many people know how it actually arrived. Some even consider it native. It's strongly suggested that they arrived to the UK from other parts of Europe by Vikings who brought them over for either food or by mistake. They are very common on UK shores, so much so but if a bivalve over 7 inches wide is observed on a beach, it's highly likely to be a softshell. Because of their size, they are quite damaging to cockle populations due to them competing for space, for both surface area and depth in sand. I just found this invasive clam in the rocky shores in North Wales. Now, the name of it is a softshell clam. One way to be able to identify it is once you run your fingers across the shell, it has no visible or textured bumps. Uh, that's different from the native clams where you can feel certain bumps on its shell. Now, unfortunately, or fortunate I might say, it's passed away, it's a dead shell. But one way to be able to identify it is through the specimen. There is more than just sandy invaders when it comes to bivalves. Here we see a native oyster that has died. This could be for many reasons, but one possible factor they may have contributed could be the invasive Pacific giant oyster. By far the most invasive bivalves we have in the British Isles are the giant Pacific rock oysters that are largely outcompeting our native oysters for space and pushing them out to succumb to predation or the tides. They have arrived on our shores in the 1800s because due to being a popular food, it was easier to farm them here than import them. The aquaculture eventually failed and invasive populations began to spread and now they are widespread across Western Europe including the Welsh shores. If you look at this possible rock oyster here, you can see both of the invasive and native um, barnacle species next to each other. See, this one has the invasive one right there and then this one here is the native one. these ones here. And it's a mixture of invasive and native on the invasive species. The worst invasive species, however, even with the Pacific oysters, is the creature that introduced all, and even caused more destruction and damage themselves beyond that. Us. We are by far the most unmatched damager to all our oceans, including our local seas and straits. With fishing gear, plastic, chemicals, and dredging kit, all just a micro amount of what we are responsible for in polluting and killing the shores we love. Evidence of our impact is everywhere. Plastic waste breaking into microplastics, snails living in discarded debris, and fishing lines tangled in seaweed silently trapping marine life, like seaweed, which are home to beautiful animals such as periwinkles. These remnants of human activity are more than just eyesores. They choke ecosystems, disrupt species, and poison the waters we rely on. Each tide brings more reminders of our negligence, yet the cycle continues. Still, nature fights to endure. Life in these tide pools adapts, but resilience has its limits. If we keep pushing native species to the brink and polluting our shores, we risk losing this fragile little one we cherish so much. But it's not too late. Every piece of waste removed, every invasive species managed, every conscious choice we make ripples outwards, just like the waves that shape these coasts. The future of North Wales' rock pools and marine life everywhere rests in our hands. Will we remain the greatest threat, or finally become their protectors? <laughs>